I'm smelling what you're stepping in. Yeah. I'm painting what you're priming. <laughs> Let's see. So I flip it and reverse it. <laughs> Is your friming nimbin wet yet? <laughs> <laughs> so quote the the great Missy Elliot. The great Missy Elliot. Is your fr 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 yet? <laughs> Alright folks, welcome back to Driftwood Guitars. Today I'd like to do an episode on how I go about carving the necks on my acoustic guitars. Um, I think everybody's got a little bit of a different technique on it and I just wanted to give you a quick rundown on how I go about skinning this cat. Because once again, this isn't the way that you should do it, it's just the way that I do it and uh, I think any little bit will help. Um, so this is a guitar that is on the home stretch. I've literally finished everything on it. This was a little bit different than how I normally do it. I, I normally do the frets and the inlays after I've got all that glued on, uh, but this deadline has been so tight on this guitar that um, I just needed to get the inlays finished. So we're at a point now where what we have is my roughed in neck. I use my CNC machine actually to, um, to create this rough blank. It cuts the profile shape for me. I hand cut the tenon. Um, I've already glued on my headstock overlay. I've glued on my back strap. I have not cut the um, the slots into the headstock yet, but this is a really the spot that I can start carving it. Um, I do nowadays use my CNC machine with a as a pin router, where I actually use a um, a roundover bit to just kind of rough in the sides. But not everybody's got that, so I just wanted to show you how you can do it without that. It doesn't take much longer. It honestly doesn't save me much time to do that, maybe it saves 10, 15 minutes. But, uh, so I wanted to give you guys a rundown on how we do that. So I'm gonna get this thing clamped to my little mini workbench here and we'll kind of run through that. So, I have already set my fretboard to the correct width. So the fretboard is my witness marks essentially um, from the nut all the way down to the end of the neck. And I've got the neck a little bit proud of that, a little bit wider than the, the fretboard itself. So what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna take a rasp and I'm gonna carve over both sides of this. I'm, gonna, I'm kind of gonna work from the middle section or from, from right behind the, uh, the headstock where it meets the, uh, the neck to about right here. And I'm gonna just start roughing it in and taking it to the area that I wanna get it to. The first part really is just hogging off the material and uh, I use these files here. Matt will show you. These are, uh, I don't even know who makes these, honestly. They're rasps I got from um, Luthier's Mercantile years and years and years ago. Um, Dragon, Dragon Files, that's it. Um, this one is a, a, a fine coarse one that I'll use towards the end, and this one here is the coarse one. Um, yeah. So your thought process in shaping this thing, like you're um, you're taking the hard angles out first, and then you're gonna uh, yep. okay. Yeah, kind of. I, I I'm gonna knock off this hard edge first, just kind of almost create like a 45. Uh, you'll see. I just kind of get in here and go to work. Now this is just so you know. Um, I got this is Spanish cedar. <laughs> <laughs> I can never, sometimes can't tell uh, remember if it's Spanish cedar or um, mahogany. So this is Spanish cedar neck, which is nice for me because Spanish cedar is like the softest wood I use for making necks. So this will actually go pretty dang quick. But uh, I think the things to remember, and if you're going to follow my technique, is I do the fretboard gets glued on and your head plate and if you are going to backstrap, which I, that's a whole separate episode, um, but if you do backstrap your necks, to get all that in place first. Um, so the almost the last thing that I do other than putting the end cap on is ready to go So like I said, I'm gonna use my course file and I'm gonna get in here And really just kind of get to work. I usually kind of Make a spot that's kind of my my stopping place I was working with my apprentice and I was showing him this technique when you're when you're filing something you can actually create a, a divot in the wood like that and what that does is it becomes a place where your file no longer goes past I'm basically creating a wall that I can't accidentally slip and send my file past it so I'll do that over there 
I'd do that right there. And then I will do the same thing on the heel end of the neck. Um, kind of right around here and here. And then that kind of, like I said, that now creates a, a, a border for me. But some people use um, spoke shapes. I find that the rasp really works well for me. There's a hundred ways you can do this. I am right-handed. Matt is left-handed, so when Matt starts doing this, it'll be a, probably he'll probably use a little bit of a different technique. But Matt's also gonna mess it up a lot. Oh yeah. <laughs> You can see how much it's bouncing around. That's why if you have a better file or a better system to cradle the neck, uh, it'll actually go a little bit quicker. So you kind of alluded to this earlier, but you're really not taking anything. You're not no. working off the top. You're, you're bringing this in. Yeah. And that's another good thing I'm glad that Matt brought up. So part of the reason why I rough my necks the way that they are before I do anything else is what I already know is that this neck is, I'm out of breath, <laughs> is, that, <laughs> is that this neck is um, already the exact thickness that I want it to be. I find that for me that is really nice because, so I know that this is the right width and it's the right thickness that I want. So now all I've got left to do is to make the apexes of all of my radiuses just touch the top of this and just touch the edge of that and then I'm good to go as opposed to there's a crap ton of extra material here and I'm you know I'm over here hogging away at material and then you what you can end up with is lumps in the neck where it's you know a quarter millimeter thicker here quarter millimeter thinner there and it doesn't seem like a lot but your hand will tell you that that's not right and um, so I recommend to anybody is that you, before you glue your, your fingerboard on, when you're making the rough blank of your neck, you don't need a CNC machine to do that, um, that you get this to the correct thickness. Um, I do, I mean, I'm out of breath. <laughs> I do uh, 22 millimeters um, thick from here all the way to here. My necks don't get any thicker in this whole area. That's why I use the carbon fiber rods in my neck so that I can have that strength. Um, but yeah, and you can see kind of what I'm doing is I'm, I'm knocking this 45 into it. Uh, I'm, I'm already almost ready to move on to the next angle, but we'll do some more on this side. So I guess you're gonna do like a 45 and a 45 and then you do like a 22 and a half. And exactly. Like okay. It's a feel thing. I'm gonna move this, this clamp, get in my way. Um, this is, like I said, Spanish cedar is the most forgiving. It's, well, I say it's the most forgiving. It's actually not because it go. You can mess up really quick too. Um, as opposed to like maple necks, they are. Uh, they take a lot longer. And you'll notice that as I do this, I start to reveal the nice shape on the back of this back strap. I am right now kind of just looking to keep this even. That's all I'm doing right now, just visually making sure that I'm kind of keeping that about the same size. So that looking good. Let me do a little more on this side. So if you're someone like me that's never really done this before, what are the mistakes that you are that you think that, you know, like, that I'm going to make the first time I'm trying to do this? I, and this is, goes not just for necks. I think that the number one thing that people do if you show me a guitar that's like, oh, this is my first guitar, my second guitar, my third guitar, the one thing that I've noticed over the years is that um, there's always really, everything's really chunky. I think people are afraid to take off too much material. Sure. And you, that is... You can always remove it, but you can't bring it back. Right? Yeah, and so like bridges um, are very bulky, um, but the big one is the next. A lot of times people's, I mean, and I'm guilty of it, my very first guitar was like a baseball bat. Uh, I think most people's... If they're making their necks from scratch, end up being very similar to like a baseball bat. Um, so that's the thing that I'd say is that to not be afraid of taking off the correct amount of material. And as we get a little closer, I really talk about that. But a big reason why necks end up feeling really baseball-y is that they, these sides are actually 
totally um, 90 degrees to the fretboard um, and you don't really want that because even if it's the right thickness is the profile's not right and it just feels very really, really big in your hand so that's what I'd say the biggest mistake is, to, is you're actually leaving way too much meat on the bone <laughs> Okay, so you can kind of stand here, Matt, and look down. Yeah. I've obviously got a little, I've taken off more on this side than over here. That's just not for any particular reason. So the next step is what I'm going to do, you stay right there, is I'm actually going to probably carve into this angle, and I'm going to carve into this angle. So I'm instead of the 45, you know, the 22, and I'm just, you know, I'm not measuring, but about 22 and a half degrees, and about another 22 and a half degrees off of that 45. Um, kind of splitting the difference. I'm basically going to create half of an octagon. Mm -hmm. uh, well, I guess more than I'm going to create. There's already an octagon, half of an octagon. So it'll be whatever 16 side. <laughs> it's, yeah. it's, yeah. it's uh, just a you know simple dodecahedron, whatever, yeah. no big deal. It's mash, <laughs> mash. <laughs> uh, but so I, I am just going to slowly approach, just like all woodworking. You're not going to go. You're not going to cut to the line. You're going to cut proud of the line and then slowly approach the line and then whether that's cutting literally cutting a line or you're doing net carving that's what we're going to do so um i'm using my bound i use i always bind my my fingerboards uh so i'm going to use my binding as a way to tell how far i've gone so if you kind of like watch this area here as i file it'll slowly start eating into that binding Almost there. Yep, there we go. So now it's now it's just starting to to eat into this binding here. The GoPro is hard to see sometimes, but okay. So there we go. Suddenly, we are very flat on top but we we're just starting to kiss this binding. This is a figured maple binding and this is a coarse rasp. So I'm not gonna go any further into this binding with this particular file um, because I don't wanna create any tear out. But now I know that I'm where I want to be. So now the next step on this particular side will be to put the 22 and a half degree angle over here. And what we are doing, just like I'm using my um, my binding as a witness line, I'm going to do the same thing in the center of this neck. I'm going to leave that untouched wood visible right there. So I once again, I'm trying to connect the line between here and here. And as I slowly bring that around, and you know, the more that we get to the angle that Matt's at, the more I can see it and feel that this has still got quite a bit um, left on it. So, let me see something. Don't mind my poor writing over here, but I'm gonna show this to Matt. Yeah, you guys are willing to say I am. <laughs> yeah, I hope this isn't too like chaotic, but this is just learning as we go. I'm teaching you the same way. So this is kind of my approach. This is our fretboard. And this is the neck. A lot of people, what they'll do, especially when they get started, they will carve it like this out of it, right? And you think that that's right, because on paper, this width here is the same. You know, for me, it's, I think it's like 44 millimeters. Um, but the correct way to do it actually is this is that this is the apex all the way out here. Oh, okay. So you actually are removing, and it's a horrible radius I just <coughs> drew. Um, but that should be your radius. Now we haven't changed that 44 millimeter width at the nut, but we've changed the feel of it. Mm -hmm. And the reason why I think a lot of people's necks feel bad is what I call this the cheek area. This area kind of right here, you can have that thing's super big like that and on paper this dimension and this dimension are the exact same you could also do it like this 
and it's still the same thickness and width, but it's gonna feel completely different in your hand. So where a lot of people mess up is this cheek area here is way too proud or way too high. So what you need to do is get that as smooth as possible of a radius in that area. So that's kind of what we're working on to bring it back over here. What this area is, this is what I would call the cheek. Uh, uh, and I'm trying to remove the material out of that area on the guitar. I'm gonna take the other side here and I'm gonna try to match it to that one. So you can see as I'm not talking, I'm going a lot faster. It's starting to look like a neck real quick. Oh yeah, wow. Um, there's a crap ton of material still left on there. I don't know, for it's a feel thing. So I, I kind of do my guitar building. My wife likes to cook and she always watches like Pioneer Woman and stuff like that. And she always gets pissed off because she's like, how are they not measuring? You know, they say a teaspoon of this and they pour it in. Well, I approach my guitar building very similar to that in certain things like this. I don't necessarily have like a profile that uh, I'm shooting for on my basic necks. Um, if a customer comes to me and says, oh, I've got to make, I want my neck to feel exactly like my 1945 D18, um, then, I, then I do exactly that. But um, on my, my regular necks, it's a very tactile feel thing for me. So I start to um, carve these necks till they feel right. Uh, and for me, it's, there's a lot left still on this neck. Um, I do measure. At, once we get real close, but there's still a lot, lot to be to be had on here. <laughs> so I'm removing the cheek area now, and now I'm kind of now I'm blending that down to the sides. Being extra careful as I get to the binding. I'm like, I'm reducing the pressure I'm putting on it as I get to the binding. So now I'm doing like a more of a follow through stroke. So if you do get tear out from the binding, um, I mean, what's the what's the thought process on that? I mean, obviously that's the worst case scenario, but let's talk about that since you know here we yeah, are. Yeah, the measure of a good luthier, in many ways, is your ability to recover from mistakes. I mean, that's not just a good luthier; the measure of a good woodworker. Uh, and so you are going to have mistakes like that. And I think that you know it's tough with maple bound fretboards because the maple's so visible, like for repairs. But yeah, I would try to find for me piece of maple binding that matches it very closely and to splice in a piece that looks really good. If it totally F's up, then I'll actually remove that side of that binding and put a new binding piece on and that you can get a second shot at that. But yeah, yeah it's just a, that's why I recommend only using the coarse rasps until you get close. Then we're going to switch to the fine. The real magic comes in with the sandpaper shoe polish technique and we'll, we're there in just a few more minutes. So I feel like this side is pretty much roughed in how I want. It feels very nice to me. This other side is not quite there yet. Something that I think about too is that the shape of your hand uh, is not a perfect C. I mean, anybody who goes like this, you're going to notice that it's flatter on this side and this weird. So it's almost like a V shape with the apex over here on the one side. So I find that as a right handed person, the way I carve my necks do naturally almost start to take on more of this shape. Um, if you have a perfectly C-shaped neck, it almost feels bulky by shift. Yeah, by shifting that apex slightly over to the left or to the tr to the base side of the neck, it actually feels more ergonomic to you as a, as a uh, as a player. So, once again, why I like to shape my necks by hand. I don't necessarily like trying to trust the router bit or the CNC machine or anything like that. There's a certain 
Yeah, I was about to say my, my instinct would be let the robot slave, you know, um, yeah. <laughs> handle but, it because it would, it would come out the, you know consistently. But, but, I mean, think about the fiddles you play. Your handmade fiddle, the neck is hand-carved. Right. You know, and you like the feel of that neck. There's a certain... As a player, there's a certain thing about it being hand-shaped that, that really matters. This, this is like the tires on a car. You are the road, and this is the one part that you actually... It has to feel right. Sure. You yeah. know, so. Once again, we're taking off of the, the cheek area. Yeah, shoot from that angle. Taking off from the cheek area. And now I'm going to slowly blend that. Yep. Just, yeah. yep. And you'll notice, and I think maybe this is something that'll help folks too, is I'm working the length of the neck. I'm not focused on here and here and then here. You do that, and next thing you know, you're going to be battling with lumps. Yeah. Uh, you want to make sure that you're staying fluid up and down the length of it. So these, la these strokes here, instead of being at one angle, these ones are going to be following that, that shape. A little bit more. So there's that. That's my roughed in neck. And I'm talking to you, and it's been 20 mm. minutes, the camera says. Yeah. Uh, I could do that in about 10 if I'm not showing folks. Weird flex, though. Yeah. <laughs> so I'm going to switch over to my fine one. I don't even need to do this because uh, of what I'm going to do with the sandpaper, but this fine one will allow me to get in here. Let me put pencil on here. This is a technique you can use too with, with pencil. So just to show you where I'm at. Do you see that pretty good, mm -hmm. right? Yep. So as we go, I'm taking that till it just touches. There, that's what I want. I want it to be the only untouched piece of binding is just on the leading edge. Matt's got to leave, so he's checking his. Yes. <laughs> Are you good for another few minutes, Matt? Yeah. No, this is just super boring, Chris. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> All right. So, the big part for me is uh, this is like a, a shoe polishing technique. Um, is you get like a, I, I get all side little uh, pro tip is uh, if a cling spore. Sandpaper. I think it's. God, I can't remember the website. But if you type in cling spore sandpaper, it'll take you to a website um, where you can get boxes of bulk sandpaper. They're leftovers for super cheap for like thirty bucks. You can get like a five pound box of Velcro backed or adhesive backed sandpaper. The best sandpaper anywhere too. But anyway, I buy that. Um, we come in here. Oh, I'm out. I'm out of my low grit stuff. And uh, I have this stuff set up so that you can come in here and pull pull out what you need and tear it off, which is super cool. Uh, but I have some stuff over here left over from my last few jobs. Um, 60 grit. Yeah, so we'll take some of this like 60 grit and we come back over here. You can shoot from, uh, which side are you gonna shoot? Let's shoot back where you are. We have the, <coughs> the B-roll camera. Um, the B-roll camera? So this is, you'll see why we call this a shoe polish technique, is you get in here, You can go like that. Now, still the exact same thing that we're doing. I'm not wanting to take off any of this leading edge. You can see how quickly it's starting to feel a lot smoother, right? Yeah. That's yeah. why I was saying like using the fine court or the fine um, rasp isn't really doing a whole lot. Um, so this can be when you're doing this technique, you can pull straight down, <coughs> and that's going to make you a really nice C shape. Mm -hmm. You can actually come out to the sides a little bit and add more flatting the top you can come like this and really work on just one side so this is a technique that takes a little bit of time to get used to but it's a super useful tool um, 
for you to be able to adjust the way that you do the radius on these necks. And with this Spanish cedar, it doesn't take much at all. You just really, I'm just wanting to get rid of any low spots, high spots, average it out, especially because this is 60 grit. So like, I want to remove the cheek area. Instead of going like this, I'm going to go like this. Same thing on this side. Because remember, I'm not wanting to take off any off this. I don't want this neck to be any thinner. Right. I can feel a little bit of a lump right here. So I am gonna very lightly work it out. Um, another tip I would give is that when you do have spots that you're trying to work out, you don't want to work out that low or high spot in one pass. You wanna work it slowly. As you do with your 100 grit, then your 120 grit and your 220, you slowly get to the point so that the very last pass is where you want it to be. So we're at 100 grit. Normally I wear a respirator with this, so many comments, uh, but you can't hear me talk. So. <laughs> Uh, no respirator right now. And then I'll just do one more. We're putting the uh, me and mesothelioma. Yeah, that's exactly it. I'll do 180. Don't act like you're not jealous of the sandpaper dispenser. Bespoke. <laughs> <laughs> All right. So I like honestly, for now, that's good. Like that feels like a solid neck to me. This is a low spot right here. You can feel a little bump. Boom. Oh yeah, just a little bit. So those sort of things tend to happen when you have any sort of twist to the sandpaper this way or that way. Well, I was going to ask, like, uh, what's your philosophy on um, you know the physicality of this? Like, I see you've got like a wide open stance. Like, what? Oh God, yes. That's yeah. You know, I. It's weird because Matt is like the second person I've had in the shop, but I had my I've had my apprentice for like two years. What I've really learned is that so much of this stuff is so much more than just like what's in front of you. Uh, I used to be in the military, you know, when you're training how to shoot a gun, a lot of it is your stance. And I do find that a lot of, with woodworking, it is about having a good stance. Uh, and I always am, am nice, firm, hip, nice, firm in the hips, legs spread open so that I can be nice and solid so that when I'm doing this, it's just my arms that are moving. And you don't, you don't want to be kind of moving around too much you want to be like able to intentional bias or, or um, yeah. Yeah, yeah you want to make sure that you're controlled where you want to be controlled just like if you're firing a gun that you're you're keeping your mo motions where you want to be uh, whether that's using a hand plane or a chisel or sanding uh, it allows you to be really focused on where you're at and the other thing that I'm doing and the way that I do it is I'm keeping this pressed up against kind of like my my breastplate so that it kind of gives me a nice sturdy spot but yeah And then I can come in here and work it a little bit. I'm not worrying about this being perfect quite yet. Yeah, it's pretty much mostly gone now. I gotta blow my nose. All the dust is getting to me. Right? Feels good? Yeah. So now. There's still a little. Uh a little is bit that, of a dent that, there. Yeah, is that my imagination? No, that's there. Okay. And that's something that I do a lot of times too, whether it's the sides of the guitar or the neck, is that if you can just trust your hands, don't even look at it. Mm -hmm. If my hands tell me there's something wrong there, then there's something wrong there. Uh, so that you can't see it on camera, but there's just the tiniest little little uh, indentation right here. So, you know, once again, that's an approach where you don't, I'm using 180 grit to remove it. I'm not gonna go in there with, 120 or, or 100. And just slowly try to remove it. Not in one foul swoop. Because I mean, at this point, the radius of the neck is basically, it's almost living where it needs to be. Yeah. Um, so you're just trying to like, take stuff away from the outside of the spot and then bring it in slowly, right? Yeah. That's kind of your thought process? That's exactly it, yeah. Other thing is here is to check and make sure that neck is staying gap free. You know, 
and you can come in and follow that through the radius of the guitar. It is a little bit of a drop off here. Uh, and then, so that's just a matter of coming through and just finessing it all. But, uh, time you gotta leave, Matt? Like, uh, 11.40? Okay. Like, 11.30. Okay. <laughs> Uh, let me show you just a really quick setup on here real quick. So I feel like I've got the main section of my neck carved. I do it in three sections. Uh, three sections. <laughs> uh, <laughs> Counting's hard. I do uh, the, the main area, I, then I do the headstock transition area, and then I do the heel. The heel is the more, com the, more the harder place. Uh, but while Matt's still got another few minutes before he has to leave, I'm going to show you how I do this transition area here. So I take it and I flip it around. We need to make one of those. Neck cradles. Yeah, man. <laughs> it's, it's another video. <laughs> yeah. See, it's starting to feel like a like a guitar neck now. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Right. I'm smelling what you're stepping in. Yeah. I'm painting what you're priming. <laughs> <laughs> Let's see. So I flip it and reverse it. <laughs> Is your friend nimbin wet yet? <laughs> so quote the the great Missy Elliott. The great Missy Elliott. Is your friend fr 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 yet? <laughs> so this is why having this headstock already cut to size to the right profile is very important because once again I know that this right here, sorry folks. This right here is the apex. And this right here is the apex. So what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna take this and just come up to the line. I'm just a horribly drawn line. But I'm gonna make that all kind of line up with itself. And you'll see quickly how I reveal this back strap. Um, then once again, the course, I'm using the rounded side now. Getting very careful as I get to the area that I've already carved. Very gentle. But this is the same idea. You're, you're not trying to round it out immediately. You're taking it down at an angle. Yep. Uh, and then you'll add the curve in later. Right. Yep. And then as we get to this end of the file, it's a larger radius. So I can come in here and, and really get it going. Now, you want to be careful as you get close to the edge here that you don't get tear out. Always being mindful of the nature of wood. <laughs> well, I see what you did. Yeah. <laughs> the nature of wood? It's from nature. <laughs> right? Boom, starting to look good. Mm -hmm. Same thing on this side. Actually, I'm, I can't believe that happened that quickly. Yeah. <laughs> You want to be very careful here that's so easy to slip and just destroy what you just did you go too low you do one bad stroke here and then you're like oh it's you got to come up with a way to solve it so I'm going very fast because I've got I've been doing this for a long time uh, take take your time <laughs> don't try this at home <laughs> and as we knock down I'm not wanting to go anywhere past that. I'm just kind of keeping an eye on all of it. Um, so now that's roughed in. You can see that it's a little it's a little janky. It kind of goes off to the right a little bit. I have these, um, these Stumac razor files, which are so awesome. <laughs> they are, I mean, they're like hand planes, like microscopic hand planes built into here. They work a little bit differently than a file, but you can come in here. They take off materials so smooth. Since it was kind of biased on the right side, now you're going in and you're taking it off. Yep. And this is uh, this is removing less material. Yeah, this is moving significantly less material. Okay. I want to get this extended piece of the next back strap to look as even as possible, just visually. The razor file is always like a there's a fluid motion you have to do to get it to cut correctly. Yeah. 
but it leaves like you don't even have to sand it when it's done. This is such a smooth finish you get. As you blend in here, once again, being very careful not to tear out. It's great for exfoliation too. Yeah, oh, it'll take the <laughs> right off of your hooves on your feet. <laughs> <laughs> but I am shooting for, and you can see it. Where'd my pencil go? Matt's always flexing his pencil game. Um, what you want is if is this I'm gonna take my see nice gradual radius there oh yeah so I mean I'm not there yet but take a look at how we how we look now backstrap is looking really good I, I still obviously it's like a little weird look right there that I'll fix that's just some tape left over from the manufacturing process but all we have left now is the heel section to do uh, then I take, um, oh, hang on, just stand by. <laughs> I usually take this, uh, pinwheel sander, buy one, um, elevateluthery.com sells really good ones, two different sizes, and Grizzly sells them, but it's just an inflatable batter, bladder that allows you to do this and the cool thing is is you've got adjustable speed I mean just your drill but I can come in here and go like this Allows me to get in there and really get it good. It's still got a little bit of work to do, but you get the general idea. So that does that. Um, Matt's got to leave, so um, I'm gonna set this camera on a tripod and show you guys how I do the heel section. Um, but uh, he'll be back, right? Matt? Yeah. Matt's oh, yeah. coming back. Yeah, I'll come right back. He's gotta go pick up a violin. Um, but yeah. Okay. So part of. What I need to do now is obviously this heel section. Sorry, Matt's gone, so I'm having to uh, narrate myself. But um, is that we need to get rid of all of this material and kind of make this whole transition area look really good so that as it meets the body, it looks really nice. Um, so as you can see, possibly, is that I've drawn in some drawn in some lines here across the top as well. And mind you, there's gonna be a maple cap that goes on top of here, so I'm not worried about any of that blowout. Same thing here, um, is I'm actually gonna take a saw and I'm gonna cut this in. So you can see how that goes, let's see. Okay, so as you can see, I'm going to now take, I have this nice little Japanese pull saw and I'm gonna follow these lines and just cut in the roughing of my neck, come on. We're having issues. Nice high quality saw is going to ensure that you don't get any mistakes here. And that should just break right off. Cool, so that gets us there. Gets us nice and roughed in. Now I'm gonna take, I'm making a mess over here, folks. I'm gonna take um, my my uh, coarse rasp and just start hogging out material here, getting that area out. Once I'm not too worried about anything right now, making sure that I don't damage any of the uh, the wood Let's fix this, there we go. Make sure that I'm not damaging any of the wood that I've already carved. I'm just trying to stay focused in this area. I'm gonna take this 
just to that pencil line. I think the biggest thing that people have a tendency to do here is if you are gonna get really close is that they're gonna go too low right here and end up with a dent uh, that you can't take out. So that's just something to be aware of as you are carving is once again, just be very careful you don't go too far. Slowly creeping up to that line. Uh, Matt was asking earlier about like common mistakes and I was talking about the chunkiness of the neck. The heel area is another place where people get way too chunky in my opinion. Um, this doesn't have to be this giant chunk of wood. I do more of a Spanish style heel. Um, it gives me more surface area for this heel to be touching the body of the guitar and gives me some insurance against um, gives me some insurance against uh, neck resets in the future. But uh, So that's another thing is I'm taking this down so it's really thin but it gives me more room for my hand to move up the neck to play higher up on the fretboard. Switching over to the razor file allows me to get a finer, more controlled cut here. What happens when you get to this end though is you're dealing with end grain and it becomes much more difficult to get the wood to do what you want it to do. So that's why it just takes longer to do the heel area. file and then we're going to switch over to the pinwheel sander or the, the the yeah the pin sander to really get her dialed in what I'm trying to do here is to get this to to line up to a perfect peak right down the middle so I got to make these I got to bring these in this is weird because I'm going from flat to radius, so it's it's just a matter of working that in. Uh, word of caution too is if you are working this end grain area with a coarse file, is they're so much harder to remove those coarse file marks. Um, that's just part of the nature of working with end grain. So I tend to err on the side of using more fine files down here. It just saves me some work. Um, on the finishing side. I did get a little bit of tear out right there, which has never happened before, so I'll have to pour fill that to, to blend that. So, this is where this pin sander really shines. I am gonna put a respirator on. So that got me there. Very big cautionary tale is to not let the back side of that spindle, if you are gonna use the spindle sanding technique, to not let it get over here and create a low spot in the neck. That's better to just switch over to hand tools and, and take it there with your hand. This is a spot, this, this kind of inner cheek area of the waist, I don't know what you wanna call it. This area here is another spot where it's really easy to just leave way too much material and to make your neck look very amateur. So if you're really wondering why does my guitar feel bulky or look bulky, I think that this is a spot where you can really save a lot of, a lot of, you can remove a lot more material than you probably are and your guitar will start to look a lot more professional. I mean, look at the heel on like a Taylor or a Martin, how nice, thin and streamlined it is. It just looks really good. As opposed to like the Gibson neck, which is a lot more bulky. And I think that there's a certain, to me, I like the more thin, streamlined look of the uh, Martins and Taylors. But uh, just, you, you can trust the wood to hold more strength than you think. 
And then like on my necks, and I think a lot more and more builders are doing it, you add that carbon fiber into the neck and you can, it's that much stronger, which allows you to then remove that much more material. I think we are about there. We are damn close. So I think that that is probably good enough to show you guys for now. Um, let's just go over it real quick. I hate that Matt had to leave to didn't miss the pool part, but um, I've still got some some work to do here, but not much. It's, it's mostly just little fine finessing things, but you can see that this heel transition area, let's move over here. This heel transition area is looking very nice. It's still to my eye needs a little bit more work. Not much. I want to keep this line as straight as possible. And then I'm going to blend all this. Uh, the neck feels really good. I'm going to go through with a micrometer and check everything and see if it needs any more finessing. And then this heel trans or the neck headstock transition area looks really nice too. Um, I still got to do the slots on the headstock and, and carve that and then glue this uh the end cap on but besides that this neck is is completely finished which is super cool this was the last step on this guitar before it's ready to go out the door uh, ready to go into the paint booth not out the door but uh cool little inlays that i've done uh, this is uh eric clapton the edge and john mayer so once again uh the client asks me to do these inlays um, they mean something to them. They're very special to them, each one of them. So I've been working on those inlays all week. But uh, yeah, so I hope that that helps you guys learn a little bit about how I go about doing this. Um, uh, let me see. Yeah, so um, yeah, I think that like uh, Matt and I were ch chatting right before he walked out the door. Um, like necks used to take me, I used to hate doing guitar necks. Um, I used to actually buy my necks pre-carved from Stumac or LMI, uh, and then I would just do the last little bit by hand, you know, uh, because I hated it so much. And I always would talk to all these builders, and they would say like, "Man, my one of my favorite parts is carving the necks." And I thought they were absolutely crazy. Uh, but the more I stuck with it, started carving more of my own necks, the more I realized that it's actually one of my favorite parts too. And you know, what used to be a two-day job, it literally took me like a day and a half to two days to do a guitar neck from start to finish. I can do in like a half hour, forty minutes now. So. Um, I say just stick with it, man. Just keep going. And, uh, you know, I encourage everybody to go out there and try to do their own necks. Obviously, um, electric guitar necks are carved a little bit differently. Uh, solid headstock guitars are a little bit different. Some people backstrap the, the headstock like me. Some people don't. So there are considerations of your own that you need to take in. And obviously, your, your neck material uh, is going to make a big difference as well. You know, uh, whether if it's a maple neck, it's going to be a lot harder. Uh, Rosewoods would be a lot harder mahogany is a little harder than Spanish cedar. Spanish cedar being the easiest. Um, it's also lighter. I, I like Spanish cedar for necks. Um, but yeah, uh, if you guys have any questions, put them in the comment section and make sure that uh, if you're enjoying these these videos, let me know and we'll keep them coming. Uh, what else? We're going to do a video uh, on this guitar. Uh, we're going to do a Porphil video. So coming like I think tomorrow. Yeah, tomorrow we're going to shoot another video and do the Porphil uh, on this guitar in preparation for its finish and then um, we've got some other stuff that we're working on as well we're still working on the electrics and uh, lots of things going on so uh, subscribe like comment and uh, we'll see you in the next video guys thanks so much